G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Well, welcome everybody. Today I'm interviewing Amish McKenzie, who is the co-founder of McKenzie Pitch Partners based in Toronto, Canada. Um, Amish is actually uh, uh, an Aussie an Aussie bloke um, from, from Tasmania where I'm based, so it's uh, good to, to talk to Hamish and today he's going to be discussing the concept of pitching and what you're not doing makes all the difference. So thanks for your time, mate. Uh, you're very welcome, Michael. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, that's no, good. And um, like I mentioned, we go back, as, as, as we're saying off air, over 40 years when we did uh, matriculation and, and university together and certainly um, some good times back then. And um, so it's uh, good to, to catch up. We haven't spoken. Last time we saw each other was about 10 years ago when you came down yeah. to Hobart. Um, who, would have, who would have thought, Michael, that uh, 40 years uh, from when we uh, were knocking around that we'd be doing a, piz- uh, a podcast together uh, talking about business issues in, in some sort of sense of authority? Very, very unusual, eh? Yes, who would have thought, right? Um, exactly. And uh, we'll, we'll obviously keep football out of the uh, conversation. So, um, so tell our audience a bit about yourself and your experience on this topic, mate. Yeah, um, look, uh, as you know, I went to university, did accounting at university, actually went into banking and worked with a number of the banks that uh, everybody would know and was in corporate banking. Uh, From there, I went into sort of consulting or training. I actually worked for a company called Rogen, who were famous back in the day for doing the consulting behind Sydney winning the Olympic Games. I worked with them in Melbourne, Sydney, and then over into London, helped grow the practice in London, and then got transferred to Toronto in Canada. And uh, sort of as happens to consultants, I had the chance to work on a uh, a mega multi-billion dollar pitch to the Canadian government, and it was a joint venture between uh, American Express, Accenture, uh, Bell Canada, and a tech company called Concur. Anyway, that was a a big success. And... uh, American Express offered me a six-month contract and, you know, about uh, three or four years after that contract, I finally got out after we helped turn their global sales team in business travel at the time, go from a where they had a 30% success rate to where they were winning seven to eight uh, deals out of 10. Uh, they're literally shooting fish in a barrel. So I was able to achieve a lot of success in, as an independent contract. And from there, I developed my own business. Uh, I wrote a book and, uh, you know, you mentioned pitch, uh, what you're not doing makes all the difference. That's the title of my book. So I thought that would be a good title for the um uh, for this podcast, and I just put a bit of clarification around that. When I say pitch, we define pitch as the effort that goes into winning a piece of business. So, you know, don't think uh, that this I'm going to be talking about grandiose, multi-million, billion-dollar pitches. It's just the concept of pitching, and I will reinforce no matter what business line you're in, uh, I find time and time again, it really is what you're not doing that makes all the difference. Yeah, that's a good, good point, and I, I gather that... Um even though you, you know you've dealt with a lot of very large global businesses, what um, you know, to talk about obviously can apply to to small businesses. For, you know, five to thirty employees, which is uh, the the people we work with. So, um, in that context, what are the key implications then that small business owners should be aware of with respect to to pitching? Well, look, uh, small business owners should be aware of uh, these things as much as big business should be because <laughs> the facts associated with winning business remain same and remain constant no matter really who you are or where you are in the world. Uh, Number one, the thing that people continually overlook all the time is that individuals make decisions, not companies. Okay, so if you think you've got a good, good big pitch to Coke or Google, you know, the reality is that there is no Google, there is no Coke, there's a brand and they've got some premises uh, and there are some individuals that work for Google or Coke, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that's who you've got to get through to. You've got to understand the individuals who make the decision. Now, as it relates to individuals, the second thing I'll highlight is the one thing that we've got in common is that we're all different. So 
if you think, you know, you got lucky on one pitch as you pitch to a group of individuals on one thing, don't think that that same argument or that same pitch or that same story is going to work for another one, right? So you've got to constantly be looking at the individuals. And the other thing uh, that people don't necessarily consider is that, as JP Morgan said, uh, people buy things for two reasons, the right reason and the real reason, meaning right being rational things, things you can typically measure, uh, like uh, time, term, quantity, volume, price, all of those things are measurable. Um, but the real reason uh, is emotional. Uh, and, you know, I say to everybody listening, think about some of the biggest purchases you've ever made. I will guarantee you that there was a large emotional component to that. In fact, on the million dollar, billion dollar pitches that I consult on, I would say up to two thirds of the buying decision is emotional. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of winning business is, is about psycho psychology, uh, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get inside the individual's head. So it's amazing, Michael, how many times you see people blindly going and pitching to, to people where they haven't got a relationship. And it's like, seriously, <laughs> you know, no one is going to buy from someone where you haven't met the person before, there's no relationship or you haven't made an effort on that front. So really it is, uh, it's a relationship business and you've really got to focus on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, unless you're selling, you know, widgets online where there's nothing needed, but certainly, as you say, where there's businesses, which is the vast majority of reality. Um, yeah. Understanding what you're talking about is so critical. Um, and too many businesses shoot from the hip or just talk about their products, don't they? And <clears throat> rather than sort of the relationship and, and the emotional pieces that, uh, that come with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, without a doubt. And I guess in just uh, in life, you know, the the pitching and the, the way you go about it can make a difference too, right? It's not business. Um, but Look, ab absolutely. Uh, and maybe if I give you a couple of examples and, and just a couple of sort of the ingredients that go into to winning business. And I'm going to give you sort of two at the, two at the end of the spectrum, if you like. I'm going to give you the, the monster big multi-billion dollar pitch, but then we'll talk about uh, another pitch that is more oriented towards uh, small business because it was a small business pitch. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to work on a, 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 a ma that major pitch that I talked about in terms of pitching to the Canadian government. And I've got a, I've, I've got a number of these pitching stories. This is, a, this is an interesting one, though. Uh, government pitches can be a pain in the neck uh, going through that tender. But again, the same logic uh, prevails. Now, we knew the minister who was making the decision. Now, he wasn't making the decision. It was his chief of staff. Uh, and we had lobbyists. Uh, employed to go in and try and find out as much about these individuals. Now, the pitch that we were working on was a technology, was a digitalization of business travel and expense management, hence the billions of dollars, because it was for the whole of the Canadian government. We knew from our intelligence that that individual who was the custodian of the decision was very anxious about the automation uh, and was very nervous because you know, if something went wrong, people wouldn't get reimbursed. Uh, and we were very nervous about introducing that new thing. So it took about sort of three to four days uh, with the teams who I was working with, but we came in with this tagline of the balance between innovation and certainty, right? So the proposal that was submitted was titled uh, The Balance Between Innovation and Certainty. Uh, the presentation that we did uh, was all about that. So when we presented, here's the innovation, but here's the security and here's the certainty that we're going to give you to assure you that it, there's not going to be any risk because it was largely a risk mitigation strategy where our competitors went all in with the technology uh, leading. Now, we had that, but we had the risk mitigations thing. So it was very, very important whenever you're pitching a piece of business to have a core solid argument. And of course, that argument was around the balance between innovation and certainty. And just from a communication point of view, Michael, having... Uh, if, let me provide the theory. If you don't tell me why I should be listening, I will make my own assumptions. All right. So your pitch has to be centered around a reason. And I'll give you a very simple example of how powerful communication can be. If we're out in the countryside and we're driving around, and let's say, hypothetically speaking, we drive past two chicken farms. As far as we're concerned, both chicken farms look exactly the same, except one has a sign on it and it says, happy and healthy chickens live here. Which one are you going to go to? 
All right. So, you know, that's why you do it. I mean, uh, the book that I wrote, it's called Pitch, What You're Not Doing Makes All the Difference. So immediately if I've impacted the reader before they open the cover, because they're going to pick it up and they say, oh, what am I not doing? So I've already influenced how they're now reading the book. So that was, you know, one of the major successes of that very, you know, humongous pitch. On a, on a different context, um, let me tell you about another pitch now. We worked with an organisation, a local organisation here in Toronto, and they're called Real Food for Real Kids. And what they do is they, um, they're catering and they cater for uh, the YMCA. Now, they had a contract that was about 40%. Uh, of the total sort of uh, what we call uh, the greater Toronto area. And they were pitching in to renew that uh, with the opportunity to, to grow it as well. Now, one of the things that is interesting about this, and I'm sure small businesses get subject to requests for proposals, the, the, the match winning move with this particular one is most people look at a, an RFP and in the RFP, typically they'll say, at a minimum, please make sure your proposal answers these questions. Uh, you know, I'm sure everybody's uh, accustomed to tenders, RFPs situation. Now, what most people do is they just put the answers to the questions. And here is low-hanging fruit, all right? because it's not request for answers to questions, it's request for proposal. And if you look up what a proposal is, it's a course of action that you're proposing. And just providing answers to questions is not a course of action. So what we did uh, with this Real Food for Real Kids as we were pitching. And I've got to remember, put this in context too, this business was on the line, all right? They had to win this contract. Uh, they had to maintain 40%. They'd gone through a horrible period of COVID. They had to win it. So we went in and we structured the proposal around your needs, our solution, RFP compliance, all right? So there were three sections in the proposal. And, you know, to start off with, the, the proposal outlined and said, you've asked us to, to give you a proposal. So we have to give you a proposal. This is how we've structured it. You know, our proposal starts with making sure we understand what's important to you. Then importantly, we're gonna present a solution. We're gonna propose an actual solution to meet those needs. Oh, and by the way, you did issue an RFP and you said these mandatory requirements, so we'll comply to that RFP. So if you net net, you look at that, the your needs, our solution part was different to any of the other competitors. Um, you know, what turned out is they won the pitch, they won 100% uh, of the market. Uh, so they've gone from 40% supplying the uh, YMCA to now 100%. And they didn't even have to present. The proposal was strong enough to do that because they created differentiation because all their competitors just went and did what everybody typically did. You know, everybody just typically goes along, goes along to get along rather than stop and think and really think about how you're going to win the business. So uh, I, I think that second one's an excellent uh, concept. Even if there isn't an RFP, Michael, just thinking about using that agenda of your needs and the solution, making it happen, tells a great pitching story because the pitching story is, um, first of all, let me confirm I understand your needs. Once I've done that, I'm going to present a solution to meet those needs. And lastly, I'm going to provide you some assurance and tell you how I'm going to make this solution happen, which of course is going to meet your needs. Um, yet interestingly, Michael, even today, you know, after COVID, people are still putting together PowerPoint decks that just represent a, a bunch of stuff that they've collated and, and they try presenting it on a Zoom environment and they wonder why it falls flat, you know, because nobody really listens on Zoom anymore. So, you know, you've got to stop and think about those sort of things. Anyway, I thought there's a couple of examples in terms of pitching. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I guess that's the the, the core of it is, is listening and understanding the needs of the, the client or the customer, isn't it? And um, then being able to position it. So if you're on the same page to start with, that's a good start, rather than just talking about yourself and how good you are and and uh, all that sort of crap, which I don't listen to. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you interestingly, so um, I, I spoke a little bit about American Express. I did a lot of work, contract work at American Express. I used to uh, work with the global head of sales and uh, mm -hmm. I spent basically 18 months flying around the world with that team uh, on every major 
pitch. Uh, pretty significant uh, business at the time because you had companies like uh, City City Group, for example, they would spend a billion dollars on travel. Uh, so we're talking about big programs that are being pitched. Now, uh, if I were to ask the the then global head of sales and business travel in Amex, uh, he would say there were two major factors that contributed to the outrageous success that we achieved. And that was number one, that structure of your needs, our solution, making it happen. And, and interestingly enough, Michael, um, he would mandate, so putting a PowerPoint deck or a structure together, he'd say, okay, we've got to have content under your needs, we've got to have content under our solution, and we've got to have content under making it happen. Now, the salespeople would be very, very good at doing the uh, solution and making it happen part, but then they'd come back and they'd say, oh, look, just not quite sure what to put in this section. And uh, the uh, the global head of sales was a really is a great mate of mine and a funny fella. He, he would say, "Hmm, let's think about it. Your needs. What would go under that?" Um, and the salesperson would eventually go, "Ah, oh, so I guess I really need to call the customer and ask the customer." Say, yeah, I think you're right. Um, and that's where it starts. You just can't win unless you get that connection uh, with the client. So that was one thing. The second thing that he puts down to the success is uh, no matter what situation. We always rehearsed every pitch three times and you just cannot afford. I mean, geez, you think about the environment that we're in at the moment. Um, a, number one, if you get a meeting, make sure you hold that meeting in kick gloves because it's hard to get a meeting. So make sure you really plan for what your return on investment is. And if you get the situation to, you know, go all the way to a pitch, you, you've got to rehearse it. And it's not a question of you not being a good presenter. Uh, it's a question of you really getting in line because you're rehearsing this customized story to this uh, specific client. So rehearsal was really, really important. So there's a couple of things uh, that were very important that uh, led to success. Yeah, no, good, and that's a good point about rehearsing. And um, funny enough, I, was, I had a, did a podcast with Jack Daly, who you, you know, hmm? uh, yesterday about sales, and he always talks about how sports teams do it so much better than. Than business, and that's one of the issues, uh, one of the aspects in that sports teams practice, um, <clears throat> whereas a lot of business people don't. And to your point, it, it was it, what's interesting, Michael, is uh, I'm a big advocate of the notion that discipline is more important than talent. Yeah. Now, I had the opportunity to work with uh, a professional Aussie rules player, and I had the opportunity to work with a uh, an ex uh, National Hockey League professional. Uh, and that uh, NHL guy uh, was a classic. He didn't hit the ice until he was 27. He's what's called a, a sort of a bit of a grinder. He did a lot of work in the, the leagues. Uh, so just personified discipline uh, before he got his career on ice in the in the actual NHL. But what, what amazes me when you're working with those sort of individuals compared to your standard business person is, my God, they have discipline. And they just follow things through to the nth degree. And I would say, you know, I'd be working with those guys and I'd give them a task. They would get the task done to nine out of 10 and then want you to literally rip it apart uh, and, and make it better. Whereas a business person uh, will do the task to about two out of 10 and you try giving them a bit of feedback and they'll, you know, uh, they'll get insecure about it and start arguing mm. with about it and say, oh, well, I did this and I did this because, you know, the business world can be quite uh, not the most dynamic place. So I couldn't agree more about the, the sports team. And when it comes to winning business, um, it is so important to have that discipline because you've got to have a pitch preparation process. Uh, and as a famous American William Edwards Deming says, if you can't describe what you do uh, as a process, you don't know what you're doing. And most people's process to win a piece of business is literally to put a PowerPoint deck together. And I'm here to tell you, it's not going to do it. You're not yep. going to win. Yep. That's some great points. So um, just to uh, to finish up, um, what's at least one thing you'd recommend a small business owner does based on, you know, your experience and knowledge around the, the pitching? Yeah. Let's look, the one thing, the most important skill uh, as it relates to pitching is listening. Um, a lot of people think, oh, you've got to be good on your feet and all of this sort of business. You've got to listen. Uh, the more you listen, the more you're going to understand the client and the more you're going to be able to develop uh, a solution. Now, I, I just said a caveat with that. Listening is hard, all right? Uh, you have to make a decision to listening. I'm not talking about hearing. I'm talking about listening. And it is a very hard skill. 
as I say to my clients, uh, beware of anyone that says they're a good listener because they may lie about other things. Um, let me just read you a definition of listening from Hugh Mackay, who wrote a great book. It's out of publication at the moment. You can still get it on digital uh, order, but it's called Why People Don't Listen. Uh, it's probably the best book I've read that's helped me in my practice. He defines listening as, I am prepared to put my own interests and concerns on hold. I'm putting you first. I'm going to entertain your ideas. Anything else is mere hearing. It's not listening. And I'll read that again for everybody. And like, as I read it, you ask yourself, how many times have I really listened to the client? Uh, I'm prepared. To, here's the definition. I'm prepared to put my own interests and concerns on hold. I'm putting you first. I'm going to entertain your ideas. Okay, now that is a hard thing to do. So if you've really listened in an hour's meeting, you should come out of that meeting a little bit tired because it is very, very taxing and draining to listen. So that's what are the words of encouragement. Now, taking that concept and giving a, a tactical skill, this is probably one of the best tactical recommendations I give, could give to anyone. And remembering too, <clears throat> the, remember the, the sort of conceptual approach to winning business, uh, you have your needs, our solution, making it happen. All right. So the tactical thing, Michael, let's say hypothetically speaking, uh, I've met with you. Uh, I met with you yesterday. So I'm back at my desk today. I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to say, dear Michael, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet with you. Uh, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to confirm my understanding of your needs before I go to the next meeting where I start presenting ideas, whatever. Right. I say, Michael, my understanding, your overall priority is blah, blah, blah. Right. And now the key needs uh, that you need in order to achieve that priority is A, B, and C. So you don't take the minutes of the meeting, you make an assessment of what is the sort of the 20% of came out of the meeting that's going to make the 80% impact. You send that off to the client, you've got to send it off to the client within 24 hours of your meeting. And I can tell you that probably when I get a response back and I've had responses, you get a couple of different, or three things can happen, right? They don't respond. And even when they haven't responded, I can tell you uh, that I've had great feedback that it made a huge impact on them actually deciding my clients to win. Number two, they might say, yeah, you kind of got it right, but here's all the things that you do need to know. And if they do that, that's absolute gold. You know, you can't afford to think you've got anything wrong, but that's absolute gold because they want you to understand. So they're giving you extra information. And the third thing is, you may have listened very, very, very well, uh, and sometimes I'll get a response saying, Hamish, thanks for this. Yep, you're spot on. I'm looking forward to the next meeting, you know, where you can present ideas. Now, I know at that stage I've got the client engaged and I'm probably greater than a 50% chance to go on and win the business uh, from there. And literally, Michael, people don't do that. And it's so simple. It just takes a bit of discipline to force yourself to listen. So if you know, too, that that's the outcome of the meeting that you have to do and you discipline yourself – it's going to force you to listen way more effectively in the meeting. Yeah. So that's yeah. one tactic. If you started doing that, I'm going to here to tell you, be a recession, be it no recession, be it whatever, it's going to make a dramatic difference to how you go about winning business. Yeah, that, that's a goal, mate. I think uh, so if all our listeners can go away and start doing that, but uh, as you say, no doubt it'll make a huge difference. So thanks for your, for your time it's been a, a great chat and um, it's good to see you got the Aussie flag there in the background still flying <laughs> um, obviously the, the Richmond flag's not there at the minute because they're not going so well but anyway for uh, our non-Australian listeners if you, can, if you can just look over yonder there, there's a poster of the uh, 2017 grand final where it all started <laughs> where, where I should say it all restarted yes yes no uh, Hamish is a, a, a very passionate Richmond uh, man and, um, yeah, they've done very well in recent times. So uh, good chatting, mate, and I look forward to uh, seeing Australia in the new year. Absolutely. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Michael. Appreciate it. Take care, mate. Cheers. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us.